in 2015, the movie The Martian came out starring Matt Damon. And in the movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, it depicts a man who's been stuck on Mars. And his crew's gone, and he's there for several years. And the only way for him to escape is for him to use an old rocket that's been left on Mars also. But the thing about this rocket is because it's old, because it's almost out of fuel, that something needs to change for this rocket for him to be able to escape Mars and him to, to go through the atmosphere and to be inter intercepted by the NASA astronauts trying to rescue him. The rocket's going to have to lose weight because it wasn't designed to run on this type of fuel. And so Matt Damon in the movie, he's going to get rid of everything. He's going to get rid of the seats that aren't necessary. There's only one seat left. He's going to get rid of all the buttons in the, the spaceship. And then he's going to get rid of the intercom system with NASA because he doesn't need that for his trip. Who even go so far, and I don't know how accurate this is, but he's going to get rid of the top of the rocket and replace it with a fireproof tarp, all so that he can lose weight, so that the rocket could complete its mission. And when I think about that too, I think we too as Christians are in desperate need of spiritual weight loss so we can complete our mission. There are things that Satan will throw at us, Satan will use to weigh us down here on this life as we're trying to run our spiritual race. And it seems to me as for the most part, we're willingly letting him do that. But I want to be very clear about this. It doesn't have to be that way in your life. Uh, maybe someone's here tonight or you're watching this at home and you just feel uncertain about things right now in your life. Uh, maybe you feel depressed over the thought that I used to be a better Christian. I didn't used to struggle with this or with that. And you're beating yourself up over that. Maybe you just feel that, that things haven't been this way before. You feel ineffective for God and you're letting Satan weigh you down in life. It does not have to be that way. But yet we let Satan weigh us down here in this world. Can you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 with me? Many of you are already there. Hebrews chapter 12. This is where we, we're going to spend most of our time tonight. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Hebrews writer is going to make an analogy here. But what does he compare our lives, compare our faith to, but a runner running a race? In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, you don't have to turn there. Paul would speak to the Corinthians and say this, Do you not know that all who run in a race all run, but only one will receive the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And again, in Philippians 3 and verse 14, Paul says similar, has similar language. I press on for the prize, or some translations say, I run towards the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Do you think there's a reason that Paul and the Hebrew writers and, and the epistle writers use this analogy over and over again? This idea of a runner running a race, could it not be because this mindset, the, this attitude is important? A mindset that I'm going to give everything I have in order that I can win the race. A mindset that there can only be one winner, so I'm going to train harder, I'm going to work more, I'm going to invest more time than anyone else. A, a mindset that my life has purpose. A purpose that I can do every, I need to do everything I can in order to obtain the prize. That's an easy spiritual analogy, isn't it? Paul's encouraging us and the Hebrew writer to take on those things, but in a spiritual sense. We need to live, work, study, and dedicate ourselves to the race of our lives in order that we may obtain to our salvation the prize of God. But here's the question the Hebrews writer is posing through chapter 12. And what I want to pose to you tonight, are we allowing things to weigh us down? And more importantly, can we win the race if we're allowing Satan to run a, or weigh us down 
as we run? And the obvious answer is no. Uh, imagine if Usain Bolt, for those of you know, one of the fastest men in the world at the Olympics, who's won several gold medals. Uh, imagine if he went to the Olympics at that time and he's warming up, they're about to get in their stances, and then he throws on a 30-pound vest before the race starts. Do you, do you think he's going to win the race against the fastest people in the world? Do you think he's going to set a new world record like he's done in the past? No, because a runner may train with weights on, but he will never run his best. And, and if anything, he will never win with weights on. The devil will attempt to weigh us down, brothers and sisters. He wants us to grow weary, to become defeated, to quit. And after this lesson, can we make changes in our lives? To to cast aside these weights, to lay lay aside these weights that the devil is putting in our lives so that we can run in order to win the prize. I see three things from Hebrews, three weights that I want to talk about tonight. The first is this, the first is sin. The first thing the Hebrew writer tells us to lay aside is sin. He'll, He'll say lay aside the weight, but then he'll specifically call out sin. Because isn't sin certainly a great weight in our race? Notice how he'll describe this sin. In verse 1, Therefore, since we're so surrounded by great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Some translations say ensnare. The sin that besets us, the sin that entangles us. This sin is such a weight in our lives that it doesn't allow us to run like we ought to. I, I have this image in my head of this entanglement as a runner who's gotten off the paved path. Uh, you think, think of the park and how they paved out, paved out these sections for runners to run on. This is a runner who's not running on the paved section, but a runner who's gone into the wayside, into the woods, where there, there's thorns and there's vines, and they're reaching at his ankles. And that's what sin does, isn't it? It takes us off the straight and narrow path of Jesus that's been paved for us by his words, and it pulls us into the wayside and does everything it can to keep us there. And the first thing sin does concerning our race is it takes away our confidence and our prize. That's a smart move by the devil, isn't it? Because what does a runner need in order to win a race? He needs confidence in what he's doing. He needs assurance that what he is doing is not in vain. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, this is a scripture you all know, be a sober spirit. Be on alert for your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But verse 9 says, but resist him and stand firm in your faith. Peter Peter tells us the devil is seeking, but what are we to do? We're to stand firm in our faith, a faith and conviction that because Jesus has died for me, because Jesus has paid the ultimate price and I believe in him and I'm one of his followers, that I can have the forgiveness of sin. The first Peter 3 and verse 21, I can have a clean conscience through baptism, through God's plan of salvation. I can have confidence in that. But what happens to that confidence when sin becomes involved? And the Hebrew writer tells us, one page over in your Bible for me in Hebrews 10, In Hebrews 10, in verse 35, in Hebrews 10, in verse 35, it says this, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. But verse 36 says, For you are in need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised. That's similar language that we've been reading all this time. The the thought that I I need endurance so that I can obtain a prize, that I can obtain this promise of God, but what do I need in order to do that? I need confidence. But how do I throw away that confidence according to verse 35? Well, we have to look at the context. And that goes back to verse 26. For if we go on willfully sinning, after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Sin is the very thing that causes our confidence in God to waver and eventually to be thrown away because Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. 
How can we have confidence in our salvation from God when, when Paul would, des- we would be, as Paul would describe in Romans 6.14, we've allowed sin to become master over us. And the thing is, we can't have confidence in our salvation. We can't have confidence in God's forgiveness when we've allowed ourselves to become slaves to sin rather than slaves to God. Now, God has abundant grace that he is willing and able to forgive all sins with. But is that an excuse to sin knowing that we have a loving God, to sin over and over again, the same sin, to let it occur in our lives, but God will forgive me. That's why Paul would say in Romans 6, what are we to say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to step on toes. But if we have a particular sin that over and over and over again causes us to sin daily, and we have this thing in our lives that causes us to not be in a relationship with God over and over again, that should be an indicator of something. That the old self has not been completely crucified. Now there's a difference between someone who's struggling with sin and someone who's not willing to make changes. It should be an indicator that there's been no radical changes made. That's why Jesus would say this. Turn to Matthew 5 with me. Matthew 5. In Matthew chapter 5. In verse 29. Matthew 5 and verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble... What does Jesus tell us to do? Tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of the body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Verse 30, if your right hand makes you stumble, what does Jesus tell us to do? Cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. What Jesus is saying is make the change. If you see sin in your life, if sin is weighing you down, make the radical change and lay aside the sin. But secondly, though, the second thing I see concerning our race that sin does is it gives us instant satisfaction rather than a marathon of sweat. And what do I mean by that? Well, in Ephesians 4, we won't turn there. But Paul would describe the old self and the new self. If you remember the context, you put on something and you put off something. In Ephesians 4 and verse 19, he would describe the Gentiles in their former way of life. He would describe them as greedy, as people who practice all kinds of sexual immorality. And he would go on in that passage to describe the old man in verse 25. He lies, is angry in verse 26, steals, verse 28, uses inappropriate language, verse 29, is bitter, verse 31. What do all these things have in common? What does all sin have in common? I can have it whenever I want, as quickly as I want. I can go have sex. I can go be angry. I can curse when I want because when I do those things, they make me feel good. I'm satisfied. The devil says, why wait for the prize when I can make your life everything you want it to be right here and now? Sin shifts our motivation. It makes us give up on studying, on going to church, on teaching and evangelism because those things take work. And the devil says, I will give you what you want now and you will feel good. But church, our faith should not be content with the fleeting pleasures of the world. Jesus tells us only one thing will stand and that is our prize, that is the kingdom of God. Do not be fooled and deceived, but run a race and never forget the prize that God is willing to offer you, that he has offered you through the blood of Jesus. For the wages of sin is death. We quoted that earlier, Romans 6.23. But that ends by saying, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is an amazing gift. But the second weight I see from the text here in Hebrews, after we lay aside sin, is, is we need to lay aside the weight of a loss of focus. The loss of focus. Look back at the text with me in Hebrews. Turn back over to Hebrews. We're going to read this quite a bit tonight. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance 
the race that is fixed before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer is very clear that as we're running this race, as we're living out our faith, we need to be focused on something. And where is our focus to be? Where is our eyes to be looking? It is to Jesus. And we'll explain why that's so important when we look at the context of Hebrews in just a minute in our next point. But can I take a minute and say this? I think it's the case that we don't fix our eyes on Jesus as much as we'd like to admit, and I'd include myself in that. And it's not because we're terrible people. It's not because we've let sin become master over us. But it's simply because we're humans and we fill our lives with so many things. Uh, You think about how many things we have to take care of during the week. We have jobs. Some of you have kids. You're in my prayers. We have grades and homework, the lawns, mow, the doctor's appointment, the football practice, Monopoly game night. You have water rafting over here, and you got your kids, ballets, recital. And we have so many things in our life. And what happens is on Sunday, I'm fired up for God. I'm excited to be here. I'm edified. I'm singing. I'm ready to go evangelize. And by the time we get to Saturday, all God's getting is my mealtime prayers because we fill our lives with so many things and we take our eyes off Jesus. Uh, my mom, she's been through a lot, but, but she always tells me the same thing. Whenever I'm preparing a lesson, whenever I'm making a life decision for me or Lauren or school, she always tells me one thing. She says, when you take your eyes off Jesus, you will lose everything. Can I say that again? When you take your eyes off Jesus, you will lose everything. And I completely agree. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Because it's not when we not we don't sin when our eyes are on Jesus. It's not when our faith wavers that our eyes are on Jesus, but it's when we take our eyes off Jesus. But when our eyes are on Jesus, we will see the prize and we will see the cost of it, and we will run faster than we ever have. We will study harder than we ever have. We will sing louder than we ever, ever sung because Jesus makes it possible. And Jesus makes it all possible when we recognize him and we see him every day in our lives. And that's when we can say, as Paul would say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain when we put our eyes on him. But can I take a moment and cautious us? Because if you remember how I began the lesson and I, and I talked about these weights I said it seems to me for the most part that we're willingly allowing the devil to put these weights in our lives, that we're willingly allowing the devil to put these weights on our shoulders and us to carry them. And I don't think it could ever be truer when it comes to a loss of focus. I think we could agree that what we focus on, what what we put our heart on and our eyes on, that will dictate what we do, what, what we say, how we live, that it will influence us what we focus on. And certainly scripture teaches that. If you want to write down these passages, Romans 8 and verse 5, I'll read them quickly. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Luke 6 and verse 45. Luke 6 and verse 45. A good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Proverbs 4 and verse 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. God's word is very clear. That what we consume, what we allow our focus to be in life will dictate certain things, won't it? It will influence how we live, how we speak what we do, who we associate with. It will impact all aspects of our life where we make our focus. So can I pose a question this evening? Where is our focus? Is it on Jesus or is it on the world? Church, we need to take our eyes off social media. I won't go around the room and ask everyone to show their phone usage and how long they've spent on these social media sites. But it wouldn't shock me if some of us have been on social media for an average of 30 30 minutes a day 
It wouldn't shock me if some of us have been on for an hour, hour a day. It wouldn't shock me if we've been on for two hours a day because you know why I say that? Because the national average in America is 2.2 hours a day for social media, for Facebook and Instagram. 2.2 hours a day, seven days a week. Do you think spending hours on something every day will change the way we think? the way we act and behave. I wonder if any of us, and I include myself in this because I can't think of a time, have ever studied God's Word for two hours a day consistently, seven days a week for an entire year. I can't think of a time in my life. Satan will use social media to shift our focus. It's a shame that these sites have become so vulgar, so inappropriate, so immodest. But maybe it's time for a change in our lives and to put these weights aside. Can our eyes be on Jesus when we are so consumed with the comment section, when we are not consumed with his words? Church, to keep our eyes on Jesus, we must care more about him than the news channel and the politics of the USA. It's been the case over the last several weeks that the church has seen people so consumed and so wrapped up in the worries of the world. I've seen personally Christians in my own life who live for the news channel, who live for the next article, who will scan Facebook for hours and hours looking for the next statistic and the next next death count. Just living for the news. And they say, Carson, do you see this? Do you see that? And, And the more I've talked with these people and the more consumed they become, the more they talk to me, the more I realize something about them. The more time they spend in the news, the less time I hear them talking about Jesus. The more consumed they become with the world, the less I see them being consumed with the words of Jesus and sharing those. I see that even people in the church are readier to wear the name of Fox News on our shirts rather than wear the name of Jesus on our lives and promote Him as the ultimate authority. People wonder why we're discouraged in this time. It's because we filled our heads with garbage. When we have a king who offers us peace that passes understandings and we bypass His word, And we look to some man-made source for comfort and security. I'm not saying don't watch the news, but I'm saying don't lose your focus in the words of God. We could say the same thing about politics, couldn't we? I hope it's never the case that we care more about the war between the Democrats and the Republicans than the war talked about in Ephesians 6, the spiritual warfare. I hope it's never the case that we care more about our role in the elections and the politics than our role in the kingdom of God and the church. I think it's the case even amongst brethren that we have fixed our eyes so much on the man in the White House that we're quicker to defend him and his followers than our King Jesus and his followers. Has Satan weighed us down by shifting our focus away from Jesus? If so, we will never be able to withstand the race because we have become entangled. We have drifted away from our faith. Can you look at Colossians 3 with me? Colossians 3, the words of Paul. Colossians 3 and verse 1. He's speaking to Christians. He says this, Therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth, for you have died with Christ, or you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. I see one last wait in the text in Hebrews that I want to talk about briefly tonight. Thank you so much for your attention so far. Can we turn back to Hebrews 12 real quickly? Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, doesn't that sound familiar tonight? Since we are so great, surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is fixed before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners 
against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The context of Hebrews 12, obviously from verse 3, is persecution. And that's why the writer is saying, now more than ever, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus because he will strengthen you because he endured the cross. That's a comfort to you during the midst of your persecution. And wasn't persecution such a weight for these Christians in the first century? It was a tool Satan used to discourage, to break, to defeat. And when those things took place in the runner's life, the runner stopped running. Now, we're not necessarily dealing with persecution like they were today in this country at this time. But could we apply this to dealing with hard times? To dealing with trials that we go through? similar to persecution. Hard times can be a weight in our life that cause us to stumble. And how these hard times are weights in our lives is they, they cause all kinds of problems in our relationship with God. They, they cause us to stumble, have stress, anxiety, and worry, and doubt, and uncertainty. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. But Satan uses, us, uses those things to stop the runner from running towards his prize. And how all these things come about is by forgetting what Jesus has went through. The only way we will be able to get through hard times, brothers and sisters, and this is ne- more, more relevant than it's ever been in the past, for especially me, in this hard time we're going through, is we need to reflect on the death of Jesus and the life Jesus lived while here on earth how Jesus was humbled, how he was reviled, beaten, mocked, crucified. When we become weary and discouraged, when we remember that, we will get through the hard times. Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Again, we can't make the parallel as good as we could to persecution. But could I encourage us this evening? as we go through trials in life, and I know many of you are, to reflect on Jesus. To remember what God in flesh did for you, each and every one of you, how he was crucified for us. To remember the words of Philippians 2, verse 7, but he, Jesus, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even obedient to the point of death on the cross. We can take comfort in that. Because when we experience hardship, when we experience persecution, uncertainty, doubt, stress, anxiety, whatever it is in your life, we can find comfort when we remember that Jesus has been here with us. But he went even further than we will ever go by allowing himself to be killed on a tree And when we realize that, we can cast the weight aside. But not only that, when we reflect on what Jesus did for us in that great sacrifice, we'll realize something else, won't we? That we have a God who loves us. A God who cares so much about us. A God who was willing to send His Son Jesus for our sins. And that God is faithful and He is able to deliver us. We will remember that when we reflect on the death of Jesus. And that has never been more comforting than knowing you have a God that loves you. We must keep our eyes on Jesus because when we take our eyes off of him, we will never be able to remain firm during hard trials. And when we take our eyes off Jesus, we'll we'll grow weary in these trials, but not only that, it will sin also. Do you see how these things are connected? We must keep our eyes on Jesus. Please remember that if you're dealing with weights tonight. To keep your eyes on Jesus. So my question to y'all are, Brothers and sisters tonight, I shouldn't say, y'all, I'm getting out of that habit. Do we have weights in our lives? Do we have weights that Satan has put in our lives that are causing us to stumble, to be weighed down as we are trying to obtain the prize? Can I admonish, as Paul did, run in such a way that you may win the prize. Take that with you as you go throughout your life. Maybe there's someone here tonight who is in need of reconciliation with God, in need of His forgiveness and His love through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. We can have that. We can have forgiveness. We can have that home in heaven. We can have that prize. 
make that right with God tonight. Maybe there's someone here and you've lived your life, but you've become entangled and ensnared, and you've just been off the waist on the wayside and not on the path of Jesus, and you're trying to make that right, and you need the prayers of the congregation, you need our help, and you need our support. We want to make that possible for you tonight because we're all running. We're all in this together, and it's hard. It is a hard race, and the devil is going to make it even harder every single day of our lives. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can't obtain that prize. If you're subject to the invitation, come forward right now as we stand and as we sing.